Welcome to this new video. Today we'll tackle an event that caused the S&P 500 and the CAC 40 to drop by nearly 12 and 17% over a 3 month period. This event is generally treated in a superficial and hasty way. News in Europe or North America generally present this event as a western movie, showing the bad guy on one hand, Vladimir Putin and on the other hand, the good guys, the Ukrainians. In other countries, it's the same story, only that the bad guys are the Ukrainians. We'll have in this video an alternate perspective. Explanations, not justifications. Was it predictable? Preventable? Facts only. For clarity, I have no interest in any of the parties involved. For full transparency, I am French. Sorry for that. Relevant sources are in the description. I'd be happy to share more links. Just put it in the comments. A very brief and hasty, but relevant explanation of what the world has recently witnessed in Ukraine would stand in this front page of the sun. In fact, as in everything, truth is a bit more complicated. First thing to be told is that what we observed was a state taking the law into its own hands. Since end of World War II and creation of the United Nations, no state has right to intervene militarily in another state, except, if the UN Security Council gives its agreement to a state or group of states to intervene under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter of San Francisco. All this is very codified. In other words, and I'm sorry to say this to all admirers of Russia, but what we've witnessed was, to be fair and honest, a power grab by Vladimir Putin against the international law and which can therefore hardly be approved. It's said, why did Putin make this power grab is also crucial to understand and is, regrettably, not explained in the news. Some history first. Ukraine is an area where Europe stops being a very diverse continent with forests, mountains, rivers to arrive in the vast plains of Russia. This corridor between two worlds is, with France, the most fertile land in Europe. In the Middle Ages, it is dominated by the Duchy of Lithuania and the Great Poland. In 1654, the Treaty of Pariaslav splits this territory still part of the Duchy of Lithuania and Poland. Left bank of the Dnieper River is attached to the Empire of the Tsars, under Alexis I. And here's our first crucial point. Symbolic. It's from this moment precisely that the Tsar takes the name of Tsar of all Russias, with the Rus of Kiev. The Emperor of all Russias. From the 17th to the 19th century, this territory is a buffer. Europe on one side. The Russian and Orthodox world on the other side. The very word Ukraine, in Ukrainian and in Russian, means border, or buffer state, so to speak. During the Russian Revolution, Stalin operates a redivision of the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, an autonomous state where an important part or a majority of its population speaking Ukrainian, not speaking exactly the same language as Russian. And they're looking towards West, towards Europe. They're somewhat the descendants of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and Poland. But to the east of this state, there's a number of territories, such as the Donbass, that are populated by Russian speakers who, in fact, are Russians, and traditionally look towards east, towards Russia. It is this multi-ethnic complex that will cause problems. First, during the 1920s and 1930s. Khrushchev implements under direction of Stalin a methodically organized famine. Ukrainians would call it Holodomor. It results in a 4 to 7 million death toll and leads to rays of a nationalist anti-Russian feeling. Therefore, during World War II, an important part of the Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainian seizes the invasion of Hitler's troops to obtain independence from Russia. That's how a Nazi movement is born in Ukraine. In the Crimean Peninsula, nearly one person out of two is killed by the Nazis. However, those weren't German but Ukrainian Nazis. Such ultra-violent and neo-Nazi movement still exists today. In 1954, Khrushchev, General Secretary of the Communist Party celebrates the tercentenary of the 1654 Treaty of Pariaslav by donating the Crimea as a gift to the Socialist Republic of Ukraine. In effect, the Crimea is transferred in due form from the Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. At that time, 
It was thought that such transfer carry no consequences given that all of this was part of the USSR, formed of several republics, including what would later become Belarus, Georgia, Latvia, Russia, or Ukraine. In reality, the transfer will have extremely heavy consequences. Why? Because there was in this Crimean Peninsula a military base that I had built at end the 18th century which is the city of Sebastian, Sevastopol. We're dealing here about the warm waters and deep water port for the Russian army. When the Soviet Union collapses in 1991 and the Republic of Ukraine becomes an independent state, it naturally keeps the Crimea. In other words, the Crimea, with its famous military basis, has passed de facto under sovereignty of another country. But here, we're dealing with a strategic jewel, fundamental to the Russian army and the very idea that it is passing between foreign hands is obviously intolerable. After 1991, Moscow is very weakened, under authority of Boris Yeltsin, who will lead to collapse of USSR and who's nowadays one of the important personalities which Russians hate the most precisely because he squandered a legacy built over course of centuries. Moscow will sign a lease agreement with Kiev in 1997, allowing it to maintain its fleet in the Crimea. In 1991, President George H. Bush, first President Bush, makes a commitment with Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO will not take advantage from the collapse of USSR and the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, with the newly independent countries. Bush confirms to Gorbachev that NATO would not extend to the eastern countries and would not come to touch Russia. There was no proper treaty to capture this, but these are assurances given several times and confirmed by several officials such as Roland Dumas, former French foreign affairs minister, or the German vice president of the OSCE. Other officials deny existence of such agreements. German magazine Der Spiegel has dug and exhumed archives precisely mentioning this agreement in a contemporaneous manner. Luckily, there are plenty of documents available from the various countries that took part in the talks, including memos from conversations, negotiation transcripts, and reports. According to those documents, the US, the UK and Germany signaled to the Kremlin that a NATO membership of countries like Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic was out of the question. In March 1991, British Prime Minister John Major promised during a visit to Moscow that nothing of the sort will happen. However, the US did not abide by those commitments. For instance, during the tour of President George W. Bush, in 2001. At the University of Warsaw, he declares that the US welcome a Europe that is united, and requires that all former Eastern European countries enter the NATO first before entering European Union. At that time, Russia is so weakened that it has no choice but to let the US apply a Chinese proverb called loot the burning houses, advocating a necessity to take advantage of everything, when the enemy is very weakened. So in 2001, Russia, powerless, witnesses Poland. Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, joining NATO. That was a major catastrophe, as the whole geopolitical shield that Stalin had obtained to protect the Soviet Union and extend its influence in Europe with the conferences of Tehran in 1943, Yalta in 1944 and Potsdam in 1945, was all collapsing. When Putin arrives in January 2000, He'll endeavor all along his career to catch up the broken pieces. All these countries that join the NATO benefit from the protection of the US and the NATO, including the famous article stating that when a state of NATO is attacked, all others shall protect it. But there are two states which still provide protection between the NATO and the Russian world. It is White Russia, the Belarus, and it is Ukraine. Belarus is led by President Lukashenko, an autocrat, loyal support of Russia who refuses to join NATO and will therefore remain one of the fundamental protection of the Russian space. The US are behind the Orange Revolution which already changes the power in Kiev. The point being to obtain from Ukraine, which is still quite careful to spare the great Russian protector, that the new government leads Ukraine towards EU and NATO membership in a discreet way. In February 2014, Several media including the Washington Post or the BBC report an audio transcript of a call from Victoria Newland, Assistant Secretary of State, to Jeffrey Pyatt, 
U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine. The transcript reveals a very explicit conversation for which Ms. Newland has then apologized. Scornful curse words put aside, the most embarrassing in this leaked transcript is that it evidences that the Ukrainian opposition is being manipulated by Washington. After the Euro Maiden, the Russian-speaking Ukrainian populations move a lot towards the Donbass, eastern part of Ukraine where they will have the feeling of being more and more oppressed, and towards the Crimean Peninsula which still belongs to Ukraine, but the Russians see that if they let things happen, Ukraine will join the NATO. And the NATO would simply get its hands on Sevastopol, again largest Russian port in the world and the one providing access to the Black Sea, to the Mediterranean and to the world. The warm water port of the Russian Navy. This is the reason why, Russia reacted. As it cannot tolerate that an element absolutely essential to its defense, the port of Sevastopol, tips into NATO. Hence the Russian intervention in Crimea in 2014, knowing that the Crimea is populated by Russians since end of the 18th century. The method was rough, it contravened international law, but it is a fact that the population in Crimea is 95% Russian-speaking and Russophile. So the referendum takes place and Putin reattaches the Crimea to Russia. From this moment on, the actions degenerate and the populations in eastern Ukraine, especially in Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts proclaim their independence and autonomy. Those are places where the populations of Russian origin feel more and more oppressed by the Ukrainian speakers. In reality, part of Ukraine always looks towards the West, towards European Union and the forces behind it, which are United States and NATO. Of course some would say, but eventually, Ukraine is an independent country, it should do what it wants. Yes. But within Ukraine itself, you understood it now, there is a people who is torn. On the one hand a population that is Russian and the other one that is not. One looks towards the West, the other looks to the East. More importantly, reality is that it's simply not possible for Ukraine to set this business without Moscow's involvement, as it is not only its history but its protection. Moscow considers that if it lets Ukraine slip away to NATO, there will soon be, as it is the case in the Baltic states, military bases that will be along the Russian border. This has even been theorized by Zbigniew Brzezinski, a man of Polish origin, who was the diplomacy advisor of President Carter and recently of President Obama, that if the U.S. managed to wrest Ukraine from Russian influence, it would be the end forever of the Russian power in the world. One can appreciate, dislike or criticize this theory of Brzezinski, yet this theory exists. Fair or not, Ukraine has become a stake all at once geopolitical, geostrategic, but also symbolic. Either it leans towards east, meaning that Russia will regain its past greatness and maintain its protection. Or towards west, meaning that it's the end of Russia as a great power. This is the fundamental stake to understand. This is why Russian leaders today will never give in on Ukraine. Now you could be asking, why would Ukraine not have the privilege to make the call and decide which bloc it would join? Obviously a legitimate and fair question. But a question missing an absolutely fundamental element. Again, reality. There's a Cuban proverb saying, alas, alas. We are so far from God and so close to the United States. Speaking of Cuba, you've probably heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The exact same situation occurred in 1962. Only that back then, it was Moscow who had decided to send and install missiles targeting the U.S. on the island of Cuba, right in front of Florida's coast. Back then, main characters of the plot were Nikita Khrushchev, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara and John F. Kennedy. When Russia sets this extraordinarily threatening and aggressive process of installing the missiles, Kennedy demands an immediate dismantling and threatens with a World War III, engaging nuclear forces. Almost the entire world considered the Russian move a real provocation. With such military powers as Russia or the US, and whatever one thinks of it, it is necessary to start from the realities. The Americans would not tolerate it. And they would be right not to tolerate it. Well, today, it is the Russians that do not tolerate that the U.S. settle in Ukraine, a few kilometers from the Russian borders. 
so this may not be to one's liking, but that's the way it is. Was it possible to prevent this situation? Yes. Were there attempts to avoid it? Yes. Several attempts. Notably at the initiative of Jacques Chirac, former president of France in 2006. Already concerned by the situation, he had sent Maurice Gordo Montaigne, his senior diplomatic advisor to Russia with a proposal to make Ukraine a neutral country, as it was already the case for several countries in Europe such as Austria, Finland or Ireland. Such neutralization of Ukraine was to be achieved thanks to a crossed protection by NATO and Russia. Back then it was only a draft. Gordo Motaini confirmed that the diplomatic advisor of Putin had shown a clear interest for it. However, when after that meeting, Maurice Gordo Montaigne meets Condoleezza Rice, she actually opposes the draft. She further claims that France had already tried to block the first wave of adhesions of countries from the former Soviet bloc to the NATO, but that France would not be able to block the second wave. Was the current situation predictable? Yes. In 2007, Putin declared that the statement of Bucharest summit in its Article 23 indicating the decision to accept Georgia and Ukraine as members of NATO was a provocation. European countries had considered the Bucharest summit decision being an unnecessary provocation to Moscow right before President Medvedev takes office. The decision was eventually postponed following interference of France and Germany. But for decades, the U.S. have been continuously pushing for the former Soviet republics such as Ukraine to join the NATO. This, while the European officials, and other countries, were always uncomfortable seeing the U.S. continuously pushing for the NATO expansion towards East. Joe Biden himself declared in 1997 that the one place where the greatest consternation for Russia would be caused for admission to NATO, of Baltic states, he even went on adding that if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance, were it to be tipped, in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction in Russia, it would be that. Although back then, he did not expect the said vigorous reaction to be military. That's all for today. Hope you've enjoyed this alternate perspective on the news. Subscribe and share the video to support the channel.